Hello, wine snubs. Welcome to another edition of The Beaten Path. One of the things that I like the most about wine snub is the ability to go back in time and follow different winemakers, especially those that I've really enjoyed over the years. I feel like it's a special privilege. And uh, so tonight, we're gonna do just that. We're gonna go into the archives and uh, look at a chat I had a year ago, roughly about a year ago, with one of my all-time favorite winemakers. I've been following Brian Bumgarner's wines for well over a decade, and I've watched his progression to establishing his own winemaking practice, and then acquiring recently, in recent years, acquiring his own estate. And I feel like it's been a very, it's been a huge privilege for me to sort of sit courtside um, and watch that happen. I have vintages of his going back to early 2000s, and some of them were very pivotal for me and instrumental in uh, gaining an appreciation for the artisan winemaking scene up in the Sierra Foothills in the El Dorado County region at large. So about a year ago, I had a chance to sit down with him and sort of recap um, where he's been, how far he's come all these years. Um, I had been watching from a distance and it was uh, a distinct treat and pleasure to sit down finally after well over a decade and have a chat with him and uh, fill in the blanks, um, get some perspective, some additional perspective on his journey that I definitely was missing these whole years. Um, but uh, yeah, so tonight we're going to go and have an unscripted chat a year ago from today. Um, this was coming right out of the pandemic, uh, the lockdowns and whatnot of 2020. It was a very difficult year and it was a great opportunity for me to check in with one of my all-time favorite winemakers, see how, there's, how he was doing, catch up as well over the previous decade. This is an unscripted um, conversation. Um, it's a bit raw. You have to excuse some of the footage. <laughs> um, this was right when I was about getting the Wine Snob channel going. Um, so you may notice some quirks, but the message and the conversation is there. I highly recommend you open a bottle of wine um, and sit down, kick back, or put it on while you're driving on your commute or while you're doing chores around the house. For me, I'm going to open a Bumgarner Tempranillo, one of my most favorite of his wines um, over the years. I think it's a very exemplary wine of what's possible in the region. Uh, very structured, bold, age-worthy wines. Um, highly understated. If you haven't tried his wines yet, I highly recommend them. Uh, so check it out, Wine Snubs. All right. I think we're good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Brian, thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's been, it's long overdue. <laughs> well, welcome to Fair Play. Yeah, I've only been sipping your wines for well over a decade now. It's been a while. And yeah, thank you for making all those amazing wines. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> um, so, man, I remember the first, yeah, I'm, I'm going way back to the tasting room Camino when you opened it. Right. Um, how long ago was that? 2010, so it's been, we're, yeah. we're in our 10th year. Wow. Yeah. And uh, and prior to that, I'd enjoyed your wines, you know, you had been making. How long have you ma been making wine? I made my first wine in 93. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and every year since. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Commercially since 2003. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. How, where, how did this start? How did it start? Oh gosh, uh, that goes way back. I would say uh, it started with a home brewing obsession. Yep. <laughs> yeah, making beer was my first love. Yeah. Um, my wife was, well, girlfriend at the time, Jennifer, uh, 
studying at UC Davis and she had a, a good friend that introduced me to home brewing. He had taken some classes at Davis and uh, that just kind of led to uh, just the love for fermentation. I've always been into cooking and, yeah. and uh, brewing kind of fell right into that from there. Um, after college, we traveled around Europe for three months and just drank our way from one country to the next. <laughs> and uh, upon our return, we were house sitting for Jennifer's mother in Placerville and realized, oh my goodness, there's, there's a history of wine in this area and, and there's wineries. I, um, I was tasting one day at Boger Winery yeah. and uh, they had some kind of water emergency in, in the restroom area and I just kind of pitched in and was helping out the tasting room manager who was serving me. Yeah. And she's like, do you need a job? And I said, oh, I'd love to work here. I'll pour wine. This sounds great. And that's how it started. Um, <laughs> ended up working there 11 years. Wow. And uh, yeah, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from, uh, from Greg. Um, I worked in primarily in hospitality and then I worked uh, as their outside sales rep but you know whenever I could I'd hang out up at the winery and check out what 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 trials were going on and he'd call me up and say hey we're tasting this or jump in and and so that uh, that led to me my first venture in wine I I came home with a thousand pounds of Zinfandel on the back <laughs> of my truck and I had nothing but beer making equipment so yeah. it was kind of kind of a stretch I didn't have a distemmer or a crusher and I'm doing this all by hand and wow. at that moment I realized how acidic wine is I was bleeding from my cuticles you know are you serious serious I did not know that yeah it's really acidic it really tears <laughs> you up but yeah I'm, I'm distemming grapes and I'm like, Jennifer comes out and I'm in her mom's garage and she's like do you know how long it takes to make wine I said yeah I know but I still want to try yeah. um, she was very patient <laughs> anyway I um, I ended up submitting that wine yeah. uh, 18 months later after aging in a couple American oak barrels. And uh, I got best Zinfandel at the California State Fair. Nice. Uh, it, I don't remember what year that was, probably 90, 94, 95. And uh, yeah, one thing led to another. I just kept doing it. I was able to do a lot of kind of experimental winemaking, just, you know, different varietals that were available. I'd, I'd uh, I'd make different uh, small lots and yeah, one thing led to another. I had a friend uh, come up and ask me to make his wines. He was starting a small winery and, yeah. and uh, I was nervous but jumped into it and a couple years later I made my first vintage. I made a Cabernet, big mountain cab from El Dorado and two years after that we opened our tasting room in, in uh, well actually it was a few years after that. It was 2005 and two, 2010 we opened our tasting room in Camino. Yeah, I remember, uh, you know, looking for you. I'd had some of the wines you had made, you know, um, under for another label. And I remember asking, you know, I at the time I had just started discovering that, you know, you can actually seek out the actual winemaker. Right. And it was through conversations with industry folks and it's like you know that's some amazing they're like oh you need to check out brian bumpgarner he just opened his tasting room over there i was like really i'm heading over there <laughs> right on and uh and yeah that was you had just opened that tasting room in camino yep. and and it was because i liked your style of wine and, and i've always wanted to ask you is that is, is it has to be on purpose obviously you're making the wine you're going through the whole process but where did you get that inspiration from what inspired you as far as how you make your wines well i would i wouldn't say it was just one thing um but i wanted to make wines that were that were kind of representative of our of our area we can make big wines up here but i wanted them to be to show some restraint and and not be as high alcohol as we can yeah. we can attain some pretty high levels of ripeness here yep. um, i wanted them to have you know, good structure um, i've always felt el dorado can make very ageable wines yes um, a lot of a lot of wines that are made up here tend to be kind of uh, fruit driven jammy yep. high alcohol so on yep. and so forth i i wanted to make wines that were structured more for aging yep. It's one of the things I, I learned at Boger actually was um, the ability of the, the wines in this region to be ageable. Yep. Um, when I first started working there, I started putting wines in, away in my cellar and um, 
during special events, open houses and things, he would bring out older wines. And, and I was like, oh my God, this this 82 cab is phenomenal. Yeah. And so that just kind of inspired me to make, um, to want to age wines, yeah. first of all, and um, to make wines that were ageable. Yeah. Well, they get so much richer too. You know? Absolutely. And, I mean, while I'm I'm not a proponent of letting wine die in the cellar, right? But given enough time to fully integrate and develop, you can have a yeah. really great masterpiece. Yeah. You know, and that's that's the whole reason why I started a cellar because I would go around and I'd find winemakers like you, and I would taste these wines just released in the tasting room, and they were showing well, great. They were drinkable, approachable, but I started, I started seeing that these wines could be so much more, right? Given some time, you know, to yeah. to kind of find their stride, you know, get their stride and such. Yeah. Well, and yeah, you, the there's just revelation that happens. Yeah. Things that are in the background will come out a little farther, and and you'll have you know, secondary flavors and yeah. and. You know, a balance developing where the tannins are more restrained. Yeah. Um, we make we make big structured wines, wines that that have some uh, tannins. Yeah. And uh, oftentimes, in, in my early days, I would I would do longer barrel aging. I didn't want to do a ton of fining and filtration, so the wines would have a little more cellar time as well. Yeah. Um, I think that was kind of a, a little bit of a hallmark of my style. And it, it, it's evolving. I'm still making wines and, and experimenting with new things every year. It's, it's, well, that's the appeal for me. I mean, we only get to practice once a year yeah. in this game. <laughs> Whereas, you know, home brewing, you could make a different beer every week, you know? Right, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, um, it, it, like a wine itself, the winemaker's, you know, craft mm -hmm. only gets better over time. You know? True. Because the... The, the amount of knowledge just grows and grows and grows and the, the detail I always often tell folks you know there are few people as meticulous as a winemaker their notes span vintages their knowledge spans vintages mm -hmm. and all the nuances of the vineyards the terroir the grapes and then the chemistry right. and the winemaking process and the aging and, and everything and they meticulously track all of that because out of all that there's all these other set of factors and variables that are constantly shifting and changing. Right. And they have to use what they know to maneuver and, and compensate for that. And there's a fair amount of guessing too, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then you get farming in the mix and, yeah. <laughs> and everything you do in the vineyard affects everything. what happens. You know, yeah. it's like... Before uh, you get to the bottle. To the every good wine starts with good grapes. Right. But not every good grape ends up a good wine. This is true. So it's it's yeah. something that you know I I, can't well, I, I have great respect for grape growers and they're incredibly brave and and patient and hardworking. Um, I've been farming for about close to ten years now. I was leasing a vineyard in Placerville for yeah. about six years, um, and I had established a small vineyard a few years before that um, in Shingle Springs at my mother-in-law's property. Um, the, the vineyard in Placerville grew Barbera and Tempranillo, and then I, I'd been leasing that, and uh, I gave up that lease when we bought the property out here, yeah. and this was a whole other challenge, and, and 10 acres as well. So I wanted to uh, just focus on, on getting this vineyard into the best shape I can, and uh, you know shift my efforts there anyway. Yeah, and, and so how many years have you been now at this, uh, with this new vineyard? So we bought this property in 2017, yeah. So, third our uh, third year now. Yeah. Um, it was a, a vineyard pre, uh, vineyard first yeah. uh, planted in 1978. Wow. And, uh, the former owner was um, consulting Davis as to what he should plant up here. He, he talked to the extension. They're like Chenin Blanc and Cabernet Sauvignon, <laughs> and put them on quadrilateral. <laughs> and so that's what he did took their advice and Shannon was really big up here in fair play in the 80s yeah. um, there was a fair amount of Shannon up here uh, he wasn't the only one that took that advice apparently <laughs> um, Cabernet from this vineyard has historically been really nice as well um, that being said we um, are doing some grafting we've taken a block of Cabernet on the 
on the north side of the prop or in the south side of the property and we're uh, grafting in some Malbec and Petit Verdot and uh, we have a small block of Cab Franc in the back um, some Merlot we're going to be working with uh, that the Merlot block this year as well but um, you make changing the Merlot. trellis from quad has been a big uh, effort this year we have five acres of cab on a high trellis quad um, too many shoot positions so we're kind of trying to bring lower it down put more energy into the vine sec select new canes and probably going to shift to cane pruning that exclusively just get uh, more energy down to where it needs to be produce some bigger clusters and hopefully yeah, i remember you were you had were, been showing me and we'll do a walk around mm -hmm. as well um the grafting that you've been doing on these vines and these are really old established 40 yeah like 43 year old vines that's you know it's, it's just interesting seeing things and i didn't i didn't it never occurred to me that you could actually do that you take these old rootstocks and just yeah. keep them going because they still have so much longevity in they them. do they do and the uh the soils out here are decomposed granite soils and they're fairly deep um the neat thing about this particular series of uh the holland series dg soils um, they are very stone free you have a few granite boulders here and there and you know where they are in the vineyard but you could dig a four or five foot hole and never come across even a stone, not even a pebble. Wow. It's just really kind of this Soft rich, sand, yeah. uh, sandy yeah. soil. Wow. And so we're doing uh, some different things to, to invigorate and get more organics back in the vineyard. We're doing cover cropping and uh, we'll be doing some composting, you know. Hopefully when we move out here, I'd like to have some livestock as well. Get some okay. grazing, you know, yeah. some mm -hmm. baby doll sheep and it, chickens and different it things. It keeps the process going. Hi, Figgy. Yeah. Winery dogs. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> she came and said hi as soon as I pulled up. <laughs> yeah. She's our greeter. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah. Lots of work in the vineyard. Um, fortunately for me, I have a 20-year-old son, Isaac, who uh, nice. loves driving tractor. He doesn't <laughs> let me in the tractor much anymore. He does most of the mowing and disking and spraying. And uh, Awesome. Yeah, it's been, it's That's been good. good. It's good to have help, you know, especially now with 30 acres. Yeah, yeah, we need it. <laughs> wow. Well, it's a family, family business, you know. That's the one advantage of having uh, a large family, having yes. a bunch of kids, is you have a few <laughs> more hands to help. <laughs> How many kids do you have? We have five. Wow, yeah. nice, yeah. We have uh, two daughters. Um, one is 18, one is 16. And um, Isaac, I mentioned, is 20. Elle is at Cal Poly now. Just started oh, at Cal Poly. Cal Poly. Fiona's a junior year, Cal in their Poly junior where? year of high school. Where in which Cal Poly? Oh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Oh, yeah. I love that place. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's pretty nice. Yeah, wow. But um, then I have two younger boys. One's 15 and one's nine. So we're still in the thick of it. Anyone, anyone, any one of them interested? Well, there's your 20, the one year old. Well, yeah, Isaac so. for sure, and he's actually uh, been helping me in the cellar as well. So um, he's starting to learn about, you know. He's a very good operator, good operator in the tractor and, yeah. and on the forklift as well. He's trying to build his confidence in terms of lifting those barrels, yes, you know, it's... four and five layers high. And, <laughs> um, yeah, a little, little trepidatious still there, but wow. um, my yeah. daughter Fiona uh, has mentioned possibly being interested. Yeah. No, no commitment yet, but she's also very artistic and she's done a lot of help with us uh, in terms of she wants to study design, but she's done, you know, some social media and some different design stuff for us. Collateral. So I have a question. Is you know, it's been in the back of my mind, and you mentioned way going way back to mm -hmm. the beginning when you started getting drawn to wine. Um, when you're traveling over across Europe, what region, what wines, or what styles like drew you or still or captivated you? Well, I, I would say I'm an equal opportunity wine lover, for one, yeah. but um, just the, the historical nature of it was pretty impressive to me. Yeah. Um, I'd say the closest I actually got to wineries over there yeah. was in Greece, of all places. It was in, in the Peloponnese. Wow. We were staying in a little Greek town that was kind of a... Um, it was neat. We met a guy uh, in Patras, and he's like, oh, you're from the U.S., aren't you? And I said, yeah, I was 
born in Bellevue, Washington, and he's all, well, I lived in Seattle for years. And he was telling us all about, you know, the Greek countryside and told us, give me your map, I'll tell you where to go. And he took our map and said, you gotta go to this little town called Kokovatos. It's about an hour and a half from here and it's close to Olympia and you can go here and go there. This little town is perfect for you, you'll love it. And it was like a vacation from our vacation. We've been just kind of hitting, you know, all the, all the big spots, but uh, this was just an amazing little town. It had, um, first of all, it was on the beach, it was 20 kilometers of white sand and all the footprints were ours because it was off season. <laughs> and it's not, it's not touristy. There's no hotel in the place. Um, there are a ton of uh, people from Northern Europe and Scandinavia that had vacations home, vacation homes there. Um, had a, a restaurant, a winery, cafe, um, a bar, and yeah. you know, it was, it was off the beaten path. Amazing. And so we'd go down uh, at night and well, go out to, to the various restaurants, and sometime during the course of the day, we'd take our Evian bottles to the local winery and we'd fill them up right out of the tank, and they would tell wow. us. There was an obvious language barrier, <laughs> but uh, they would tell us as much as we could comprehend about the wines and how they were made and you know, we'd walk through the vineyards and it was just a beautiful, beautiful uh, place and very memorable. But um, as far as other other regions, uh, I was captivated by the wines that I, I encountered in Spain and, yeah. and in France. And, um, we were in Tuscany a bit and that was just magical, it was beautiful there. And, yeah, I, I, I've, I always felt your wines echoed that Mediterranean, that traditional Mediterranean style. You know, yeah. right? Big, bold structure, mm -hmm. needs time to relax and, you know, integrate. Yeah. Um, dry, you know, and it's just the way I like it. Nice. You know, terroir driven, obviously, uh, I, 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 that's what drew me to your wines was that they're very, um, for lack of a better way of describing, I've always thought of it as <clears throat> masculine. You, you know, say that. strong, well built, almost, you know, pillar like, yeah. you know, <laughs> wines. Um, so today we're going to take a look at one of your wines. Yeah. Um, new wine for us, grown by one of my neighbors out here in Fair Play. So I've been explore, exploring more and more some of the vineyards in Fair Play. Um, and it's an Alicante Boucher. We'll, we'll check out the Alicante. Nice. It's a big wine. I've never had an Alicante Boucher by you. Oh, so. <laughs> very good, very good. Okay. First time. So this is a 2018 Alicante. It's from the Barrelhead Vineyard, just right around the corner on Slug Gulch. So, um, what do you like the most about um, Alicante Boucher, like, from a, as far as a, its expression? If you like big wines, yeah. Um, they do. <laughs> yeah, if you like big wines, Alicante is big in a lot of different ways. Um, first, color. Um, a lot of people historically have used it for blending because it's just packed with color. Um, so if you have a lighter wine, you want to blend in a little bit of um, it's a nice hue. You can do that. Uh, it has ample tannins. It's got good acidity. I mean, it's really it can correct for a lot of different things. Um, but as far as a varietal, it's just got beautiful oh, fruit. It's got got pepper. It's uh, it's just a lovely wine. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Wow. You know the story of Alicante. I uh, know. Refresh my memory. So, a uh, couple of French botanists, father and son. Uh, the father had taken a a local grape in his area that was uh, a Tinturia grape. A Tinturia grape is a grape that has red flesh as well as red skin. So the color comes out of the crusher like that. It's dark. Immediately wow. you cannot make rosé <laughs> unless you're even, removing the colors. You can't blame it on the skins or any, no. you know, or you left the skins in long and it just, you crush it and this is how it comes out. If you just open, the, take a bite of the grape, look Stain at the flesh, the it's red. Wow. So he had he had been working with this grape, um, and his son took his work, and he had crossed it with another variety. His son took that grape and crossed it with another grape. By the way, the, the father's son, their last name was Boucher. Oh. I think it's Henri Boucher. Mm -hmm. um, the son took that 
grape that his father had hybridized or not, you know, crossed with yeah. this Tinturia grape. And he crossed it with Alicante, which is what they call Grenache in his region. Okay. So it became Alicante Boucher. Wow. That was in the 1800s, uh, 1880s or so. But... I did not know that about Alicante Boucher. Mm -hmm. I, you know, but it, it's one of those names that always gave me pause every time I heard it. It's like, how did they settle on this name? I mean, Chardonnay is one thing, Merlot is another, but right. why Alicante Boucher? You know? <laughs> well, it's like Petit Syrah and Derif, right? Yeah. It's, a, I think it was common for, you know, if you created a varietal to name it after yourself, but then Alicante comes in there and it's like, where'd that come from? But yeah, apparently they called Grenache Alicante in that region. It's a little shy on the nose. I like that. It's a nice berry, little fruit mm -hmm. there. Um, but the body is just, it's dry. It's got nice crisp tannins in there. Yeah. This is the signature bum garner structure. <laughs> it's pretty firm. Yeah. I can see this given some, quite a bit of cellar time. Those tannins. I think it's, I think it's very ageable. Yeah, once those tannins mellow out, uh, I think you'll see a little bit more of that terroir Mm -hmm. coming to the forward, to the front, to the forefront there. You get the pepperiness in there too? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. kind of fun. Is this going to be a one single vintage thing or? Um, I think, well, no, I got some this year as well. Um, I didn't get any in 2019, but I did get some in 2020. And I'm kind of looking at that little piece of ground over there by the road. Yeah. That might be kind of fun to throw a few <laughs> rows of Alicante in there. Why not? I can probably fit uh, 500 plants or so, maybe half an acre. How much would that make? Like how many barrels? A couple tons. That'd make probably four or five barrels. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just your little passion yeah. line. Yeah. Your signature line. So we were going through the, uh, the cellar here and uh, you were talking about the, um, the cider. Oh yeah. So how did that start? How did the cider come about? <laughs> well, our, you know, our tasting room in Camino, we're in Apple Hill. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we've lived in Camino for 20, 24 years. Mm -hmm. And our next door neighbor had a cider press and, um, and bolsters. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with the Apple Hill ranches, but bolsters yeah. was, um, he's always been a juice producer. So I'd go up there and get you know, up 50 gallons of juice and ferment it and all these time all this time i've been making wine it was a nice pleasant crush pad cooler you know yeah. something to drink during the hot summers uh, so naturally when we opened our tasting room in camino in the middle of apple hill um, i thought it would be a natural to have some hard ciders as well with the home brewing background i i brought over my um, my garage Mm -hmm. uh, kegerator and I put that in there and I would usually have you know three or four different ciders on tap and then we introduced the silver fork line with the re returnable bottles and so that was just kind of a natural uh, we did some wines and some ciders different style bottles ciders obviously have a, a pressure yeah. rating and uh, people would bring their bottles back and get five dollars credit towards their next cider and or wine and uh, this year we introduced some bubblies as well we're calling them bumblies <laughs> <laughs> i like that you gotta work with it you know i'd like, like i'd like to to get a couple of those because i've um i recently i've, I've recently started paying a little more attention mm -hmm. to bubblies brutes and yeah, yeah. you know champagne sparkling uh from this region as well because they're surprisingly good right yeah, but i think they're very understated and and oftentimes not even given you know a lot of times you're greeted at the tasting room yeah with their bubbly and it's kind of like a, a handout right but it's great stuff good stuff yeah, yeah. i had a uh, not an accident but i i had some senso come in i was planning on uh using an around blend mm -hmm. and it came in really low bricks um, apparently the uh the samples i got were from a different section of the yes. vineyard. It came in at 19 <laughs> bricks. Oh, that so is low. Immediately I pivoted and, and uh, okay, this is gonna be my rosé this year. 
and I had um, I had some Merlot also come in low brick. So I, I'm doing a Cinso Merlot rosé, which will be probably be in the bumbly. Nice. But, uh, it's got beautiful <laughs> aromatics. I bet so. I'd, I'd love to. I'd love Maybe to we pop into the winery and could take a sip of that. Yes, that it's, would be. It's yes. just in, you know, in the tank right now. But we visit it in a, about three months. Yeah. With some bubbles. Yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting because uh, I always looked at your wines as a, you know, very mature traditional style. Uh, you know, I, 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 I would say your wines probably appeal more or at least initially to an intermediate to advanced palate. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who's been enjoying wine for a while and their palate has been developing over time. Right. And they've, they've found um, a, a, an appreciation for nuanced terroir, you know, more structured wines. And so it kind of was a, an interesting, fun surprise to see, you know, when I came to the other tasting room and all of a sudden it was, you know, hey, you want to try some of our cider? And, right. You know, so I saw, you know, I saw you adding a little element of fun in there, but you know, you, a little something for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> you have to admit, though, the ciders are not your average cider either. No, they're, they're not, not. They're not Angry Orchard, <laughs> you know, they're not, yeah. you know. They're, they're uh, a serious winemaker's take yeah. on a cider. Right. Which they're, is, they're crisp, they're right. dry. They're, yeah. I've, I still relish the new you know yeah. so i'm always looking forward to trying something different yeah um, challenging yourself yeah outside the box that's great yeah i think that's that's kind of a common feature with winemakers as well well you have to be agile you mm -hmm. have to maneuver literally every year something that's coming speaking of which 2020 how was harvest this year it was pretty smooth actually um I was, there was some concern, obviously, early on about smoke taint. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of ash. In, in August, I was walking through the vineyard and clusters were sizing up nicely and I'm holding, just taking a look and checking out the clusters. I smelled my hand and I was like, oh man, that's a lot of smoke. Yeah. But it was, it was very surface, it was ash and it kind of blew off. We didn't really have levels of saturation here. Most of the fires were 100 miles away. So while we dealt with you know, some pretty poor air quality yeah. we, we didn't really have enough smoke to taint the grapes fortunately um, aside from that everything came in pretty evenly i didn't have this big crush of fruit even though we had some pretty uh, pretty warm days in august and september things came in pretty evenly uh, finished up probably the third week of october and uh, that was just some some last minute things that came in. But I was pretty happy with it. Fantastic. Uh, I'm glad. Considering all the other things we had going on this year, we had this we yes, had a lot. The pandemic. Yeah. You know, you you know, we're here now in mid November, pretty much. And you said you finally just opened mere weeks ago. Yeah, we um, our tasting room in Fair Play just opened. We've been open in Camino, but uh, we had a lot of uh, adjustments to make we had to make more outdoor seating in camino and so we had, we had tractor work we had to do we had um to get a bunch more tables and so on and so forth we had to get flight glasses and just basically totally renovate how we're serving yeah. um i put refrigeration out, outdoors so we could keep the whites chilled in the warmer months uh, there's a lot of different things a lot of pivoting we had to do but uh, that being said I think our customer experience has been greatly enhanced because everybody has to have an appointment now and it's a sit down deal. You, know, you come in, you're investing an hour, hour and a half time. It's not a You're going to experience through. the wines. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are really fast to go to flights. We kind of held off on that um, thinking that, well, maybe during Apple Hill, we'll introduce the flights as there are people that want to come out and socialize and they're not really interested in hearing about each and every wine, yeah. you know, um, so we have that option. But um, everything else, the experience has been very intimate, it's been table side. Yeah. And uh, sales have been good. I have to say we've had great support from our club, great support from, from our customers across the board. You know, when, uh, you know, when the pandemic first hit earlier this year, you know, how much I love these, you know, this region and you know 
and all the winemakers that I you know care about and follow are really small artisan winemakers and you know I, I worried a lot that they would not be able to you guys would not be able to maneuver right you know and, and, and adapt and but I have to say I was thoroughly impressed I mean I'm really proud of how winemakers such as yourself you know this entire region there was not a single peep when this happened everyone just mobilized adapted right. Right. and did what it took and and they've been able to make it work and i'm really proud of what you guys have been doing man well i think i think that's as a small business owner you have to do that or you die yeah. not literally yeah. but figuratively i mean um one of the things that we did and i'm not just pointing this out for any other reason other than just to show that um you know you had to make quick decisions the first week of the shutdown we did our first uh zoom um zoom tasting zoom tasting yeah. and, and that's been kind of an, a unique feature in fact the day before yesterday um this has carried on in in a corporate sense i have a couple different companies that i've been doing onboarding you know they bring on a new employee yeah. typically they would take that employee out to dinner yeah that can't happen right now so yeah. we've been doing these um, corporate zoom tastings i've been doing one one to two every month um, in addition to you know uh, wine club releases yeah. let's have a zoom you know let's let's get together and yeah. and do some pairings and talk about these wines and so forth so we've been doing a lot of those um, I think a lot of people are tired of Zoom on the one <laughs> hand, but Zoom with wine can be actually kind of fun. Hey, you so. know, it's, I know, and it's probably more that there are, because I'm one of those people where I, I work, I've, you know, we've pretty much gone to work from home full time. Right. And you're on Zoom all day long. And yeah. so, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you're just like, I don't want to get on Zoom. Right. You know, but uh, it, it definitely certainly helps, you know, it's, it's kind of comforting too, you know, to get on for something fun, something you like, something right. you enjoy and you care about. Yeah. And uh, well, it can be an, an intimate format, one on one with the winemaker. I've got ten executives from a certain company, and they're like, "Ask me anything. Let's talk about it. What are you getting in this wine? And, and uh, what, what is that malolactic fermentation you're talking about? You know, and yeah. just they can have this kind of really hands-on experience that That's, you know that, it, yeah. it wouldn't it wouldn't really it have wouldn't, happened. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. Otherwise, so. yeah. Well done, man. Yeah. <laughs> mm. So, what's uh, what's your total production these days? Uh, we're doing about two thousand cases. So, so and that I'm trying to think is that including the cider, we should do about five hundred to a thousand cases of cider. Wow. In addition. Um, but wine-wise, I think it's about 2,000 cases. It's very, very artisanal. It is. Most of the lots are between 150 and 300 cases. That's right up my alley. Yeah. I, I, I think, and you know, let me know, you know, your thoughts on this, but I really feel from my experience, a lot of winemakers I follow, they make those smaller lots, you know, mm -hmm. anywhere between 50 to 200, sometimes even up to three, 400 foot for a specific lot. Right. But I find that when when you hang around that that range that size um, there's a certain level of complexity and layering that happens that really can't be replicated on a, on a larger large, scale on a larger scale yeah i think um you have you just have an ability to um, keep that lot very pure and and kind of tailor the wine to the direction that you want it to go. Sometimes when you get bigger lots, you're, you're dealing with multiple, um, could be multiple vineyards. Yeah. Now, a lot of the vineyards up here are very small. They might, may not have five tons to sell you. You might be sourcing two yeah. from this guy and one from that guy. Yeah. So yeah, you can definitely uh, kind of keep a real hands on. Yeah. Well, I certainly appreciate that, man. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's. I appreciate all you guys who really stay true to the craft, stay involved, and um, and really just keep that passion alive. I know it's definitely tough. Winemaking business is very tough. Um, it's challenging. Yeah, <laughs> you wear a lot of hats in the wine business. Yeah, but uh, but it's our. I think it's our passion. You know, 
it never really, I mean, I won't say it doesn't seem like work. It's, it's a tremendous amount of work. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's varied, you know, there's a lot of different things. It's seasonal. You have um, a lot of different activities throughout the year. But uh, when you're doing the farming, that becomes kind of a big focal point. Um, well, you've yeah. sorted out the winemaking part. You'd sorted that actually quite a while ago, a right. long time ago. And, you know, this is the next you know ongoing yeah and and, and this is a this is kind of a you think of it as a legacy too you know you're you're building you're crafting and getting uh, the vineyard and it's producing the type of wines that you want it to produce and, uh, you know something that will outlive you hopefully so, yeah your vintages I mean right. you're gonna be doing this pretty much as long as you can stand up on your two feet so yeah. um, you know at some point and the way you make your wine. <laughs> Very usual. Yeah, I can see your vintages going a long, long way. A guy I used to work with at another winery uh, just texted me this week and he's like, oh my God, Brian, <laughs> it's bittersweet. But, uh, I shared a bottle of your 2007 cab with my wife and it was our last bottle, but it was amazing. Oh yeah. So, oh yeah. I have some of it's your- It was fun to hear. I have some of your mid to later 2000 vintages just sitting in a nice. bin and I think I Coravend one uh, maybe a year ago wow it's not ready wow yeah it's, it, it it came out swinging really <laughs> so well, curious yeah. what vintage that was <laughs> yeah. yeah I'll go back I'll have to go back and check and I'll, I'll get back to you and uh, you'll uh, you'll definitely know mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll, I'll be posting that one um, do you do that often uh, Coravend it and come back yeah. Like how much later can you come back? Um, I'll usually make a note and I'll put a little neck tag on it. Mm -hmm. I don't do anything fancy, um, but I'll just put a neck tag, neck tag when I checked on it and when to follow up. So sure. based on, I'll taste and I'll say, okay, you know, here's where the levels are on certain characteristics. Given its age, maybe it could use, you know, check in in two years, okay. check in in a year. Um, but, uh, that's such a unique opportunity to be able to take a sneak peek, you know? That's why I obsess over what you guys, guys like you yeah. do, because I, 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 I get to follow. And for me, when I come out and I taste and, you know, I'll, I'll go through the tasting room and there's certain specific wines that, you know, you've been doing for a while and I've been building verticals. And, and so it's just for there's certain automatic buys. I need to grab these, this, this, this. Mm -hmm. It's like grocery shopping. And then what's new and then I'll go through that and like okay that's kind of the expression is similar to this uh right. you know now get a little backstory on it and then make a decision I'm gonna you know take a couple of these open one now and then you know have three four and then just forget about lay it. them down in the back in the darkest corner of the cellar and nice <laughs> because there's others that need more attention but, yeah. um but I love that and you know one of your wines which actually you introduced me ironically to this variety was Tariga. Right. You had the one Tariga you made. I made a couple of vintages. Oh, okay. I did a couple of vintages, but um, I wasn't able to get the grapes after that. They had contracted with a port producer and, and it just, it was all going to that port yeah. producer. Um, I just loved what you did with it. I, there yeah. was just something about it. And uh, yeah, every time I'd come up, I would hound you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I think I cleaned out your last half you case probably or something. Did. And, I, I, I'm pretty sure I might have a bottle or two in my I cellar. I have about one or two left. Okay, um, wow. I've, I've, I've gone through them. I, it finally, and I did the same thing, you know, core and checking and, and uh, you know, it kind of got where I was like, okay, I think it hasn't changed much. Mm -hmm. I think this is it right now. Right. This loose three to five year period is going to be the right time. Yeah. So, but I think I'm down to one or two. And so wow. that's... <laughs> Yeah, I love, love that varietal. Yeah. Um, I like the expression. Me too. Um, you know, there's there's some around here that really, Petit Verdot is another one that does mm -hmm. the way the terroirs express. Movedra does that. Yeah. Um, Toraldigo, I've been running into a little more hmm. these days, especially out here is another, you know, obscure varietal. Um, you know, something that I would love to see you make What's that? is a Nebbiolo. Oh, I have a, that's interesting. That's interesting. <laughs> like Barolo style, yeah. like from Lange, you know, right. just, ugh. 
because that's i think your style just lends itself it just walks right into the, okay you know, <laughs> the hands of a nebbiolo <laughs> that's interesting i have i got some cuttings from uh, a friend recently and i was like ah, i should i should grab a couple you know see how that would do out here i think yeah i mean it wouldn't it doesn't have to be anything big because i i think it's such a it's such a specific profile mm -hmm. um it, it appeals to such a specific palette and i, I don't right. think the average palette out here is really you know on that level but it could be an interesting signature unique piece you definitely know? really small batch <laughs> if you think about my portfolio a lot of them are just kind of like these this Cabernet, that's yeah. what we started with. There's uh, Tempranillo, Cabernet of Spain, right? Mm -hmm. Barbera, yeah. Um, Petit Syrah, yeah. Um, there's a Bordeaux blend, and they're all kind of big guns, but they, they, yeah. they're what the region is known for, right? And and you have to provide something that's recognizable to the market for sure. But yeah, I think yeah, Nebbiolo. <laughs> put that Just in the hopper. A little seed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so uh what do you think about the we can walk around a little bit let's and take then, a walk we can yeah. um check out some of some of the grafting that we've done this year we grafted some friulano and uh, malbec and petit verdot mm -hmm. and um take a look at our little shin and blanc experiment nice yeah. all right let's do it are we going to take a walk, Fahey? Want to go for a walk? Good. Okay, go for it. Let's go. So we are walking into our Semion block. It's about a, about a half an acre. Um, we did some replanting, a couple of missing vines this year. Uh, we usually take this block and blend it with our Sauvignon Blanc. Do like a 50-50 blend, kind of Bordeaux white style. Um, getting ready to do some cover cropping just just this week and we'll be adding uh, some some vetch and clover oats uh, something else in the mix there so but, what what does a cover cropping uh, help with what does it what's... well most of those plants um, and peas as well they're nitrogen fixing they they take nitrogen out of the air yeah. and pull it down into their root zones and they have little nodules on the root zones that fix nitrogen into the soil and then you disc in all of the um, above ground yeah. green manure basically yeah. so that really helps to uh, just add organics back into the soil we have a very granitic soil here it's very sandy so it, it adds uh, moisture holding ability in addition to uh, being able to bring so more nitrogen in naturally so if we don't do uh, cover crops, what, what happens eventually? Well, you're pulling nitrogen out of the soil yeah. every year. That's, that's you know, production of your grapes. Um, you need to put it back in, otherwise your grapes aren't gonna produce, they're not gonna grow. Um, and it's just better to do it in a sustainable, yeah. um, uh, I prefer to farm organically as well. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> rather than putting petrochemical nitrogen into the soil, and bring it in either with compost manures and or cover cropping. So fall is here. Fall is here. Our leaves are getting ready to drop soon. We might have had a frost this last week. I'm seeing a little bit of burn in some of these. But it's definitely coming. What does uh what does that what are the implications of the of a frost? <laughs> oh just um, the all the green will go away and, and you lose um, lose all your leaves pretty quickly. Does it affect things next year? Uh, at this point, it's just a natural process. Okay. Grapes are going to go to sleep. The energy goes back down into the root zone. And from there, uh, we will uh, be doing our pruning and stuff like that. Coming in January, February, we'll start pruning. Uh, a lot of a lot of these blocks are going to be going into more of a cane pruning mode right now they're still spur pruning and hopefully we're going to try and get rid of this star thistle it's a real pain but uh, we're going to be probably getting rid of the cordon and just going to cane pruning so you'll save 
one of the canes from this year. Yeah. And then each bud will be a new cane. Yeah. Each one of these buds, you lay this down and each one of these buds will be a new cane uh, with their own clusters. Gotcha. Cool. It just kind of renews every year. Shall we take a look around? Yeah. See this soil? There's absolutely no stones. It's just going all the way down. All the way down. Figgy will go after the, the gophers out here and she'll <laughs> dig literally a four foot deep hole. And uh, only problem is she doesn't fill them in. <laughs> That's your job, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it's you come across some of these holes sometimes. You can get your tractor stuck in them. Great big deep holes. And this vineyard here? This is the Sauvignon Blanc. I think there's seven or eight rows of Sauvignon Blanc here. Fairly long, probably a little more than a half acre. We got our disc all set up here. And then starting here, we just, uh, last year we grafted this block to Free Lano. This was Cabernet, and it was on quadrilateral, so we cut off these old vines here and grafted in um, free lano. So you can see, take a little bud like this, and you cut a little notch into the, into the um, stalk, yeah. and you bud graft that in there, and that becomes your new vine. Wow. And so that, that will be cane pruned this next year. You'll probably select this cane and this cane, and that'll go on the wire. Everything else will be pruned off. And uh, when did you graft these? That was grafted last year, yeah, which is pretty neat. Um, there's a lot of energy in, in these old vines, so they, see, those uh, those they, graftings are they're pretty, pretty vigorous. They're pretty yeah, they look pretty mature. They yeah. Get so um, I think last year we did like three rows. I added another uh, four rows or so of the Friolano this year. And so we'll have the Sauve Blanc, Semillon, Chenin Blanc, and Friolano as our white wine selection from the estate. Um, we also grafted some Malbec and Petit Verdot for our Bordeaux blend. We have uh, five acres of Cab, about a half acre of Merle uh, Malbec, Petit Verdot. And uh, we also have Cab Franc and about an acre of Merlot. Nice. And the estate goes all the way. It goes. It, the the estate runs east to west. Um, just it's almost a mile long. It's a really long, narrow property. We have a green belt right down in the middle with a pond. It's year round. We've got fairly good water for fair play. It's it's pretty impressive. We get about 20, 22 gallons a minute on our oh. on our wells. But you have this little saddle here in this ridge top, yeah. and the the water flows right through the middle of our property. Thank you for watching along uh, with today's segment of The Beaten Path. I hope you found it enlightening and interesting. Um, leave a comment below if you have any other winemakers you'd like to see some in-depth, free-flowing conversations with um, and explore more of their story, the part they often don't get to tell you. Um, but if you haven't tried uh, Mr. Bumgarner's wines out, I highly recommend you check him out. What I love the most about his story is the persistence, tenacity, and um, his drive and passion for making wine. Um, it's really shown over the years and especially um, in great adversity. So this, I feel this winemaker embodies the essence of the winemaker up in the Sierra foothills today. Um, that entire region um, I regard as the frontier of California winemaking. Um, you find many winemakers just like this that go against many odds over the years spanning time um, with extreme patience and tenacity 
um, to make some of the best artisan wines um, you can find today in California. We're going to talk a little bit about this Tempranillo. This one is the 2016 Tempranillo El Dorado. And uh, what I love about it is how much it evokes that terroir. There's certain key things I look uh, from each region, uh, depending on where wine is from. And one key characteristic of this region is the granite leather. Um, I don't know how else to explain it. It tastes literally like there is granite dirt in there. There's a certain terroir note of granite. This usually comes hand in hand with uh, a star anise. And I'm not quite sure where that comes from. I'm still trying to find out, wine snobs, what exactly lends that distinct note. Um, but uh, it may be a play between um, the mineral and the other terroir notes and uh, the essence of the grapes, of the vines. Uh, but if you have any ideas or clues, drop them in the comments below. But this one comes with a dark, rich color, a nice warm nose with ripe plum, some ripe plum skins in there, um, and dark cherries. That's very typical of Tempranillo, especially in this region. You get a certain sweetness um, as the fruit tends to have a longer hang time up in the hills. Um, so this lends a more intense ripe ripeness to the fruit just on the nose alone. His wines are fairly dry, especially for the region, um, just because grapes tend to ripen really intensely and flavors tend to develop very intensely up in the hills. But nonetheless, um, his wines tend to be fairly dry. Body is fairly dry, has a nice mouth feel, has a slight creaminess on the back of the body there. You get some ripe plums, slightly ripe, not too ripe, and slightly ripe dark cherries on there. That leather comes through, that granite leather, which is very typical of this region again, a decomposed granite. And there's just the right amount of oak, just a touch. And this really rounds out that body and otherwise very big varietal for this region. Tempranillo expresses itself very bold, very structured and intense up, up in the Sierra foothills and its general region. Um, and the oak softens it ever so slightly. Um, the finish is fairly dry. It takes a while, but um, there's a fair amount of grip. It's a fine grain, dusty grip and uh, leaves you with just a little more of those terroir notes. As usual, there's a little bit of spice heat. It's more of like a warmth. One of the things I like about this wine is out of the bottle, it needs time. So if you get, if you're trying one of these wines, I recommend opening, decanting it, and enjoying this wine over several hours. Uh, about two hours in, those tannins are going to fully expo express themselves. That grip is going to become ever tighter and is going to really show its youth. Even the 2016 at about five years now is barely ready, in my opinion. It's drinking, showing very beautiful in the right now, but I think the real treat is down the road at about the 10 year mark, 10 to 15 year mark for these wines. You also get that star anise that I mentioned is going to come way to the front. Um, you're going to get a lot more of that granite. The fruit's going to pull back a little bit um, and it's just going to make for a really beautiful, enlightening, uh, intriguing experience as you explore the wine over the course of an evening. So that's why I recommended opening one when you started the show. So if you didn't, get on their website, order one more, order a couple of them, lay about two, lay two down and open one, um, put on the show, or if I'm online, get with me on live and we can do a, a remote tasting session. But uh, yeah, let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below.